All right. I was speaking with some people after church this morning, and I was explaining how, you know, I preached a lot of sermons prior to coming here, and there's things I just don't always remember. I'm like, did I preach that here or not? And I, don't, I realize not everyone's going back and just listening to everything that I've ever preached, you know, going back for years and years and years. And it's kind of good now for me to go back and, and look things up because there's key doctrines that, from my perspective, oh yeah, I preached on that, but I've never preached them here. So there's a lot of things that I'm going to be going back and, and double checking on. Like when Brother Miller asked me a couple, you know, a few weeks ago, or whatever about the self-defense, like, oh yeah, I've covered that, and then realized, no, actually, I never even did a whole sermon on that. Those are those are good things to look at. And uh, this evening, this isn't a very complicated doctrine, but we're going to be looking at when the Bible talks about the election or the elect, um, who that's referring to, and what does that mean. And in my opinion, I think it's a pretty, like I said, it's pretty simple. I think it's pretty easy. But it has a lot of ramifications and can really impact your doctrine in many areas if you don't get this down right. And, you know, I, I put the title of my sermon as The Election, so just so it doesn't look like clickbait, if anyone's tuning into this sermon, this isn't about Donald Trump or Biden or anything like that. It's a totally different election. But along the same lines, though, you think about an election, like a presidential election, what are you doing? You're choosing. Right, so you're putting forth a vote, you're choosing, that's why we have elections, because you're selecting somebody to be a leader. Well, the elect or the election, that, that meaning still is the same. So when we see that in the Bible, when we see the elect or the election, it is a cho uh, you know, choosing, chosen, you know, they're selected for various purposes and they have various meanings behind it. And just like with just pretty much everything in the Bible, um, you know, context is key. So if you want to understand who the elect are in Scripture, you have to get it in context because this is one of those terms or one of those, uh, you know, one of those terms that could be used for more than just one group of people. Okay? There, there's some terms that you may be able to apply um, consistently, exactly the same meaning all the way through, but the elect or the election is not one of those terms. And I think that's where a lot of people fail in their theology and in their, you know, in, the, in their doctrines that they come up with is just always assuming that when the Bible talks about the elect or the election, it's always just talking about the Jews. Now, many times it is talking about the Jews as a group, as the physical nation of Israel, but that's not always the case. So you really need to just take this word especially and, and, and understand the whole context of what we're looking at before you get a full understanding of who it is and don't make any assumptions on what, who the Bible's talking about because literally the word elect is just chosen. Okay, now we started off in Isaiah 42 and we're going to look at verse number one and we're going to compare this with Matthew chapter 12. Because in Isaiah 42, this is a prophecy talking about Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah 42 verse one says, Behold my servant whom I uphold. Mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. This is talking about Jesus Christ, and I can prove this by, if you turn to Matthew chapter 12, we'll compare this side by side. So mine elect, literally it's talking about a singular person, it's talking about Jesus Christ himself. And this is, by the way, the first usage of the word elect in the Bible. And this is also another good point to bring up because I know people always go, you know, use their law first mention and the first time it's used, you know, is kind of the definition all the way through. Not with this word. I mean, it's, it's, it, it depends, well, depending, depending on how you define it, right? If, if you just mean by chosen, it's great. That applies perfectly, consistently all the way through, chosen. But who is the chosen and who does it apply to? is determined by context, right? So if the definition, your definition of elect just means chosen, great, that's a good definition. Use that all the way through, it's consistent. But who, who are the chosen, who is applied to, that changes on the context. So Matthew 12, verse 15, the Bible says, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all and charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, and then it's gonna quote, Isaiah 42. So 
we just see in Matthew 12, he's doing all this stuff, he's healing people, and he, and he makes sure that they don't say anything because now he's going to fulfill this scripture, which is about himself. Verse 18 says, Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. And one of the things you could also notice here is that in Isaiah 42, it says, Mine elect. And in, uh, in Matthew 12, it says, Whom I have chosen. So it's, it's using the synonyms of elect and chosen interchangeably there, showing us that that's literally what that means. And, you know, if you just know the English language, that shouldn't be a big deal anyways. Very easy to see that. But there we have the Bible also just kind of defining that within the, uh, you know, the, the Hebrew going in English versus the Greek going in English there. And uh, the... the uh, quotation from the, Old the, from the Old Testament in the New Testament using uh, uh, synonyms, which, by the way, on a different point, I think also exhibits how God preserves his word and to the detail. And yes, we believe in every word of God. And I'm not for changing words of God, but you have the same meaning coming across here, exactly the same. And um, it's still the perfect word of God that has been translated when they're quoting Old Testament scriptures using synonyms um, for the words that were that were given. And that and that was a, a very good, uh, perfect translation. But anyway, I don't want to go down that rabbit trail and, and start getting into that. because That's not what the sermon's about. But I want to point out, you know, when we, when we look at this. So the first mention of elect is literally referring to Jesus Christ. There's sometimes in Scripture, you turn to John chapter 6, where the Bible uses chosen or elect, and it doesn't even always mean that the people are saved. John chapter 6, verse 70, the Bible reads, Jesus answered them, he's talking to his disciples, have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So the disciples, the twelve disciples, were elect. They were chosen by Jesus Christ himself to be his disciples. And he's saying, look, I've chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. One of them wasn't even saved, yet he was elect. Yet he was chosen by Jesus Christ. And he was chosen for a purpose, right? The disciples were chosen for a purpose. The fact that they were chosen didn't just automatically mean they were all saved, but they were chosen for a purpose. And when it comes to the Jews, you know, that, that is commonly called or known as God's chosen people, which I'm not even completely against that terminology either, because in many contexts that is correct and true, and we're going to look at that. The problem I have, and the reason why, the, one of the main reasons I'm even preaching a sermon is because people take that too far and it becomes like a Jew worship or this thought or doctrine or understanding that the Jews are some special people today that get some special pass and special privileges by God because they're the chosen people. And that's simply not true. And that simply has never been true, by the way. They've never just received like just all kinds of extra benefits by being physical heirs or descendants of Abraham. Now, God has given them a you know, land and led them into promised land, but we're even going to see, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter number nine. I'm going to read for you from 2 Timothy chapter two while you're turning to Deuteronomy nine. 2 Timothy chapter two, verse 10 says, therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes. And this is talking about this apostle Paul. He's in his, just in the previous verses talking about his tribulations and things he's gone through. He says, I endure all things for the elect's sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So in that context, when he's talking about the elect's sake, he's talking about physical Jews. That's who he's talking about there. And like I said, many times you will see that, but it's not 100% of the time. You can't always assume that that's who he's talking about. Here it is, yet in this context, when he says for the elect's sakes, he wants them to be saved. So they're elect, but they're not even saved. Now, if you're not saved, there's only one place that you go when you die, and that's hell. Everybody needs to be saved in order to go to heaven. 
No matter, no matter who you are, no matter where you're born, bottom line is God is not a racist. And elevating one group of people over another as if they give some special rules that only apply to them would mean that God actually cares about their physical descendancy and things like that, which he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't care about that. He doesn't care where you were born. There's one God and there's one way to heaven and that's Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the physical Jews of his day, the ones that rejected Jesus, the one that, that, that you know, crucified him and said his blood be on us and on our children, they ended up dying and going to hell you know, if they didn't put their faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter that they were physical Jews. It doesn't matter that they were called the elect or the election. It doesn't matter at all. I do turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Because even though God did make promises, which is where the election even comes from, and we're going to see that, the reason why the Jews are known as God's chosen people is based on promises that he made to Abraham. God made promises to Abraham that of his seed and of his descendants, you know, that he was going to do certain things. He was going to lead them and give them a land for inheritance. And he was going to do all this stuff. But it was because of Abraham. And he was blessing Abraham by blessing his descendants and giving them things and choosing out a people for himself that was supposed to look to how Abraham was and how Abraham acted and the faith that Abraham had as their father to guide them in their faith and their, um, in, in their service to the Lord, right? So he was supposed to be kind of the father of that nation and they should have been looking to him for the example of how they ought to be, but they didn't uh, by and large. And we're going to see this. You say, Pastor Burson, that doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard before. Well, let's just read the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 9. Because God didn't want these people getting lifted up in their own minds. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Now, of course, in Deuteronomy, especially here in chapter 9, this is Moses talking to the children of Israel. They had been taken out of Egypt. They'd been delivered from Egypt, from the bondage they were suffering. Remember, Moses led them out and all the great miracles were done and the Red Seas parted. And then they go through the wilderness and they're in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they're going to uh, finally pass over Jordan and go in and, and defeat the enemy and inherit the promised land that was promised unto them. Okay, this is where we're at in the story. And he's saying, you're about to go in and to possess these nations. Verse 2, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? And, <coughs> excuse me, and these were giants. Okay, these were people that when the spies went out the first time, they feared them and thought there's no way we can do this. And that's what caused them to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. That's all done. They're finally getting, getting ready to go in there. Verse number three says, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord hath said unto thee. Speak not thou in thine heart. After that, the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, for my righteousness, the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. So he's warning them right away before they even make it in there. He's saying, look, God's going to go before you and he's going to deliver this great, strong people from before you. As he promised he was going to do, he's going to go. He's going to fight your battle for you. He's going to win. But now when you get there and when you inherit, don't let this go to your head and think, oh, because we're so great because we're the elect, because we're the chosen people and our righteousness and we're so good and we can do no wrong and they're wicked, but we're good. That's why God gave us this land to inherit it. He's like, don't let that go to your head to think that you're so much better than everybody else. This is what he's telling the Jews at this time. Okay, this is the instruction to them. 
Verse 4, again, Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast him out from before thee, saying, for my, for my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. So he's saying it's not because of your righteousness, it's because of how wicked they were. And when you read through Leviticus, especially around chapters you know, 18 through 20, and you start reading all the death penalty judgments and all the things that you might question, why is this even have to be written in the Bible that this is wrong? And, you know, because it's so bad stuff. That's when you see that the nations that were in the land before the Jews came in, before God delivered them up, had done all of those things and were guilty of all those things and were just, um, just committing all manner of abomination. Which is why God sent them in and basically told them to destroy everybody that was living in that land. And a lot of Christians, you know, have a hard time with that because you're trying to reconcile, wait, God's loving and merciful. And then you read through the Old Testament where they're like destroying everything. They're destroying livestock. They're even dest you know, destroying the children and everybody in the city. Like they're just going through. And it was a command by God. But the reason, it makes perfect sense. The reason is because God was bringing his judgment on a really wicked nation. And it wasn't new to that time. He had already, you know, brought his judgment in the form of a flood, a worldwide flood that destroyed all living apart from Noah and his family, right? So you know that there were children alive during that time too and the world had just gotten so wicked overall that God just decided, you know what? I'm going to bring judgment. We're going to start over. And there's other times too, right? God rained fire and brimstone down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. They were just extremely wicked and just committed all manner of abomination. You know what? God just had enough and he said, we're... we're, we're Wiping it all out. This was no different in the land of Canaan. The Canaanites that dwelt in the land also had just gotten really, really wicked, committing all manner of abominations, and God just said, you know what, I'm going to bring judgment in. And God in his providence was capable then of not only bringing judgment in on a wicked nation, he also then kept his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by bringing those people into the land to give them the inheritance that was promised unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's fulfilling, you know, multiple aspects of his will through these events. But Moses is warning the people, don't think it's because you're so righteous. Verse number five, not for thy righteousness or the, for the uprightness of thy heart dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. So he, re he, I mean, he reiterates himself. He literally just said that and then says it again. Look, it's not for your righteousness because you're stiff-necked because you don't want to listen. You've just been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. God's not bringing you here because you're such a great people and awesome people and you could do no wrong and everyone needs to bow down and worship you. Okay, that's not why he's bringing the Jews into that land. It's not why at all. Verse 7, Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came unto this place. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord. This is the people. Now look, this was from the beginning of them inheriting the land. Why do you think it got, did it get way better? Did the people just become way more godly? How about today? Are the people that are called the Jews inhabiting the land of Israel just the most godly Christian people that you know in the world? So should we then, as Christians, as believers, exalt these people who may have physically descended from Abraham and say, wow, God hath chosen you and we're going to just show a lot of extra honor and respect unto that? No, not for their sake, that's for sure. If God was going to deal with them at all, it would be for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not for them. 
And even back at their beginning, God's saying, look, you're very rebellious. And you could read the rest of Deuteronomy. I'm not going to go and read the rest of Deuteronomy 9 this evening. You can do that later, but you, you continue to see how Moses just brings up all these other events that happen. Like, look, I'm the one that had, it, had to intercede for you when God was about to wipe all of you out because he was sick of you because you're rebellious, because you're not listening, you're not hearkening, you're not doing what he said to do. Abraham, when he was called, right? And this, Moses didn't say this part, but when Abraham was called, he, he went. He obeyed the word of the Lord. He left in faith. He didn't know where he was going. That's why God chose Abraham to give him these blessings because Abraham listened. Abraham had faith. Abraham was willing to do what the Lord had for him to do. And Abraham trusted completely in the Lord. Unfortunately, his descendants didn't have that same faith. But because God made promises and because those other people were really wicked, the Canaanites, God said, well, I'm going to keep my promise because God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his word. He was bringing them into the land. He was wiping out the wicked people. But this group of people was not some righteous group of people. The physical descendancy means nothing. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we even see, you know, we're fast forwarding now. This was way back when the Jews are entering into, the children of Israel entering into the promised land. Right off the bat, they're being told, hey, it's not for your righteousness. Don't get a big head. Now we fast forward past all of their kings, all the time that they were ruling and reigning in Israel to the time of Jesus Christ. Or right before Jesus starts his ministry, there's a time of John the Baptist. Okay, John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. He's baptizing. He's making you know, a big stir among the people. Pharisees and Sadducees represent this old-time Jew religion that was not worshiping the Lord, by the way. They didn't believe Moses. They claimed to believe in Moses. They claimed to believe the Lord. But they really didn't because as Jesus said, hey, if you believe Moses, you believe me. And they didn't believe him because they didn't receive Christ. You say, if you, you know, the Bible says if you have the Father, you have the Son. And they don't have the Father or the Son. In Matthew 3, verse number 7, the Bible reads, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So here he's calling out the Pharisees and, and Sadducees, calling them snakes, calling them vipers. Say, what are you guys doing here? Who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Verse 8, he says, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Oh, you really you believe unto Jesus Christ now? You believe you're putting your faith in the Lamb of God? Because that's what they needed to do to be saved. They were trusting in their works, they were trusting in the law, they were trusting in their own righteousness. Which is isn't ironic enough, they were warned not to do. And you don't think. You know, don't trust in your righteousness and that's why God's giving you this inheritance, giving you his land. That's exactly what the, the Pharisees and Sadducees are thinking in Matthew chapter 3. And look at what he says. He says, bring, therefore, uh, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Because he knows that's what they're trusting in. Oh, we're elect. We're chosen. We're children of Abraham. That's why God loves us. That's why we're special people. And he says, don't say that within yourselves. We have Abraham our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. See, that means nothing. See that rock over there? God can make that rock a, a child of Abraham. That doesn't mean anything. What matters is your faith. What matters is your heart. It doesn't matter who you're born from. And this is a message to, to Jews. Don't to think themselves anything special themselves because of who they've descended from. And it's also a message to Christians. Don't think anything special of anybody, any group of people, just because of who they're descended from and, and where they are in the world physically or whatever. None of that matters. It doesn't matter. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. And we're going to see that in a little bit. It doesn't matter. The only time the ancestry ever mattered at all was under the Levitical priesthood because there was, um, you know, rules on who was going to serve as a priest or as a Levite, you know, in the house of the Lord. And that's it. 
who was able, who was allowed to perform those sacrifices. That is why they had to keep track of their ancestry. But it wasn't because of, you know, oh, well, you had to be a Jew to be saved or anything like that, because all nations were welcome to become a Jew and to put their faith in the Lord. And many people of other nations joined themselves unto Israel because they chose the Lord as their God. Turn to Romans chapter 3. You say, best versions, and why, you know, why even bring up the fact that they're elect? Why does that matter at all? Well, they were chosen. They were chosen, as I mentioned already, because of Abraham's faith. They were made promises to. And there is an advantage, or at least there was, there was an advantage at that time for being a Jew. There was. And the Bible tells us that there was an, an advantage, and we're going to see exactly what that advantage is. It's not, well, you got an advantage because you just got a free ticket into heaven because you're one of the chosen people. Nope, that's not it. Romans 3 verse 1 says, What advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. So there is an advantage. Verse 2 says, much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. That's the advantage. Because God used that people to be the lighthouse to the world. God used the Jews to deliver his word unto. So all the prophets and the, you know, and, and, you know, Moses and the prophets and the people that God used, they were all of Israel. That's who he was delivering his word unto. That's who he was using to give the word of God and to provide the truth unto this world was unto that group of people. So yeah, you know what? There's a great advantage to, to being a Jew because you're really close to the truth, right? I mean, you've got, you should have, you have it right there. In similar fashion, it would be the same advantage that a person has coming into this world, being born in a Christian household. Right. Yeah. You've got the Bible right there. You're being taught. You could be, you could learn the truth. Just, you just so happen to be born there. As opposed to people say being born in a Muslim nation, Right. That's a disadvantage yeah. because you're surrounded by people who believe in a different religion, a false God, a fake religion that can't save. So there's a disadvantage. So there's an advantage here. Just similarly, the advantage of being a Jew is, hey, you've got the word of God. You've got you've got the synagogues and you've got the you know, Moses being taught and you've got all these things going on at that time to, to guide you to the truth. And it's just easier. Right. But that doesn't mean that people can't be saved or whatever in any nation it's just it's just not as easily accessible so that was the advantage of, of being a jew and advantage of being one of the elect so-called now turn if you would to romans chapter 11. romans chapter 11. Romans 11, we're starting verse number one, and we're going to read a lot of Romans 11. Romans 11 is a lot, um, a lot of content on this subject of the election and the elect and understanding it more fully. Verse number one says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? And his people, again, is referring to physical Jews in this context. God forbid, for I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So Apostle Paul is saying, look, even though by and large, the Jews as a people and a group, they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he came unto his own, his own received him not. Right. right? Now that is painting with a broad brush because that was the majority. But it doesn't mean every single individual just completely rejected Jesus. Of course they didn't. I mean, his disciples outside of Judas accepted him. They believed in him. And, and many others also did believe in him as well. But they were in the minority, not in the majority. And he's explaining here, look, God didn't cast a, just completely cast away all of the children of Israel. And he's saying, I'm an Israelite, right? God didn't cast me away. 
I am an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Now, this is interesting also, because he's talking about Elijah here, and you can see this throughout Scripture, how often the majority, even of the Jews, God's chosen people, reject God's prophets. Within their own nation, within their own people, Elijah suffered lots of persecution. And he's preaching to the Jews. He's preaching to Israel. He's preaching to that group of people that is supposed to be God's chosen people. Yet, and that's why he said, Paul's bringing this up, saying, don't you know what the scripture says? How he made intercession to God against Israel, his own people. Saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. And that's why you see also in the New Testament where the, the Pharisees, you know, are saying, which of the fathers hath, which, of, which of the prophets hath not your father slain? And they, they, bear, they bear witness against themselves that they are the children of, uh, of their fathers. Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees for that in, in the book of John. But then verse number four, he continues on with this because Elijah thought he was all alone. Remember, there's all these Baal worshipers. And Elijah's just like the only one standing for the truth, standing for the Lord. And he has that great scene where, you know, they build their altars and they say, let the Lord, you know, let the God you know, answers by fire be the true God, basically. And, and of course, you know that whole story. I'm going to go into it. But um, he thought he was all by himself. And he even gets in despair thinking, God, you know, just kill me. I've been trying to preach to these people and nobody's listening and no one wants to hear so uh, verse four gives us God answer, gives us God's answer in those story in that story. But what said the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So he's explaining that even though Elijah felt like nobody was with him, there, you know, he was, he was informed by God, hey, there's still 7,000 people that believe. There still is a remnant. There still is a small amount of people out there. 7,000 among a whole nation isn't that many. But there's still seven, you know, it's, it's not like it's just you, Elijah. Now, unfortunately, those 7,000, where were they? Right. <laughs> where were they showing their support? They were being quiet to make him feel alone, to make him get depressed. And, you know, shame on you, Christian. You allow, you know, people who are making a stand get hung out to dry and face the persecution and, and stand alone when... The, the workers of iniquity come and attack and destroy and the Baal worshipers come and try to, and try to tear them down. Where are you? Where's your support? Don't, don't leave the Elijahs out to dry so that they just want to give up. But now the Apostle Paul is bringing this to mind saying, okay, look, just like it was back then, you know, God still had a group of people, a remnant that, that was believing. He says here, verse 5, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And I love that he uses that term, the election of grace, because that is the election that matters. It's the election of grace. It's not the election of being a physical seed of Abraham. It's the election of grace. Because God chooses everyone to be saved that puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone that accepts his grace is elect. That's right. Verse 6 says, And if by grace and is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise work is no more work. And side note, great passage. If you don't have this verse highlighted or memorized or you know, have this reference, when people try to mix faith with works, and try, to, and try to, to mix the two together and say, oh, no, no, I believe in Jesus, but you've got to do this, this, and this. And that's why they're trusting and be saved. Great verse to demonstrate, look, you can't, as soon as you mix works in with grace, it's no more grace. Because grace means it's undeserved, it's unmerited, it's a gift, it's just given to you. And works means you earn it. So if you, if you have to receive something by grace, but then add your own works into it and your own earning, 
Well, now you just, you might as well just have it all be of works. You can't call that grace because you're, you're adding your own element to it. It's not, it's no longer just a gift. It's either just a gift or it's not. Even if the amount you have to do or work is very, very little, it's no, you can no longer call it grace. So great verse, just, you know, as another side note, you know, note this one, make, make mention of this because he just says, hey, if it's grace, no more works. It's no more works. Because people say, oh, yeah, yeah, you get saved by believing, but, I mean, then you've got to follow the law, you've got to go to church, you've got to pray. Is it grace? Because if it's grace, then it's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. You see, then you can't say it's grace. If I have to do all this other stuff, it's not grace anymore. But if it be of works, then it's no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Let's keep reading here, verse number seven. What then? And this is, this is extremely important. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Another reason why context is important. We've seen a verse already that talks about the elect being Jesus Christ himself. We've seen the election being referred to as physical Jews, physical descendants of Abraham. Absolutely, that exists. But now we see a very, very clear distinction between Israel, which would be those physical Jews, the physical descendants. And he's saying Israel, they're not the election because he said Israel hath not obtained, but the election has obtained. When you're studying out the Word of God and you're coming across, you know, words like this, you can't, you know, this one in particular, you cannot just assume it's always talking about Israel. Because otherwise, I mean, if you did that every single time, then this would make zero sense. Right. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but Israel hath obtained it. Right? <laughs> Swap the election for Israel. You can't do that. Right. So this is talking about a different election, which makes perfect sense because in verse 5, he just talked about the election of grace. So the election, many times in Scripture, can also refer to believers. And more so in the New Testament, you're going to see that being the important definition, even though both are referenced. So when you're looking at promises, when you're looking at things that are, that are good and a good connotation of, having, of being part of the elect or the election, it's referring to people who are believers. Because you are in Christ, who is the elect. Our election comes from the elect. You have Christ in you. You are also then elect through him. Verse number eight, let's keep reading here. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back all way. Now, notice he brings up Elijah. He brings up David. He brings up Isaiah. He's talking about all these different people who are basically like cursing Israel. I mean, it says, David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block to God. Who is he talking about? Well, the subject hasn't changed yet here. He's talking about Israel. If that's the case, you know, this is how you prove different doctrines that you hear. And the people that, the Zionists that want to exalt the Jews above everyone else and say, basically, we have to worship the Jews and we have to fly an Israel flag and because God said that if we, he'll bless us, if we bless them. Well, hold on a second, because that doesn't match with what I'm reading in Scripture. And it doesn't match for any time period either. Because we can look where God actually is punishing Jehoshaphat for helping the ungodly. And you know who he helped? He helped Israel. Jehoshaphat was a king of Judah. Ahab was a king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat took his forces and his troops and helped Ahab militarily, yes, militarily in a fight, right, against their enemies. 
And he says, oh yeah, well, our people will be like, your people, we're going to go, we're going to offend you. And then a man of God came and, and rebuked Jehoshaphat and said, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? He says, don't do that. But I thought we were supposed to bless them. No. No. Well, if you go back and look at that reference in Genesis, God was talking to Abraham. He says, I will bless him that, that blesses thee. Thee is singular. He's talking to Abraham. And curse him that curseth thee. It does, it's not this broad brush statement of anyone who ever comes from your loins, Abraham, if anybody blesses those people, I'm going to bless those people. And if anyone curses them, I'm going to curse them. And it doesn't matter how wicked those people are that come from your loins. That's just going to be the way it is. That's ridiculous. God didn't deal with the people that way. God's own people didn't deal with the people that way. The righteous people of God, they're saying, look, let them be a curse and a stumbling block and all this other stuff. Why? When they were rejecting the Lord, when they were turning their back on God, when they were going after false gods and, false, and, and um, their idols and stuff, then that's how they were dealing with them. And that was righteous, and that's how they should have been dealing with them. We don't need to get this obsession over a group of people because of the false doctrine that's out there. And you know, I, was, I brought up Jehoshaphat. He was militarily supporting. Isn't that what you hear today from the Christian right, from the Fox News Baptists out there that, that say, well, we need to support Israel. We defend Israel. We stand with Israel. The reason why they say that is because their false view and their false understanding of Scripture the reason why they're making that stand is because they go to church and they're being taught, we need to bless Israel. We need to stand with Israel. They're God's chosen people. Do you see the ramifications of doctrine and how important it is to read the Bible for yourself and match Scripture with Scripture and go, hold on a second, that doesn't sound right to me because I'm seeing all these other men of God are being persecuted by the elect, by the chosen people, by God's special people, that the people who are of God are being persecuted. Uh, um, just persecuted and I'm reading in scripture I'm reading through Romans and I'm seeing wait a minute why should we be blessing these people why should we be supporting these people it doesn't add up it doesn't make sense and you know this has severe consequences because you've got people getting their children signed up to go fight in the military to go support a wicked group of people and we shouldn't be sending people over our children to go and die in someone else's war and defend oil and other interests of people who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Why should we defend those people? There's no righteousness in it at all. There's none. Amen. It has severe consequences. Let's let the Bible teach us who are the elect in each context, what is the Bible teaching and what is right for us to do? Because in this verse, in verse 7 that we had already read, the elect is not Israel. It's not the physical seed. The election are believers. Because Israel didn't obtain it, but the election have. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. He's saying, look, I, there's nothing wrong with the apostle Paul being the, you know, an apostle to the Gentiles. He's saying, this is great. I think it's great. I think it's great that I am commissioned to go and reach the Gentiles. And then he says in verse 14, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. The Apostle Paul had a great heart for his people. You know what? There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense too. I have a lot of heart for my people. You know, people that were the, my descendancy and where I come from. I would love to see people who I've physically descended from, kin, if you will, get saved. That makes sense. I think everybody wants that. Why wouldn't you? And no matter what I'm saying today, don't get me wrong. 
you know, people who are wicked people and they reject the Lord Jesus Christ, I want them to accept Jesus Christ. I don't want the Jews over there rejecting Christ just as much as I don't really want anybody rejecting Christ. I want all to come to the Lord. Now, I know that's not going to happen because, you know, straight is the gate which leads unto life and narrow is the way and few there be that find it. But nonetheless, my heart and my desire for Israel is that they may be saved. Like the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, he has a zeal of God that he wants them to be saved. And that is ultimately the goal. But just because you want them saved doesn't mean they have special status. And that's what I'm preaching against. I'm preaching against the special status that people give to one group of people just based on who they're descended from. Because God doesn't give that special status to anybody. In fact, the special status, if you have more, the Bible says, unto whom much is given shall much be required. So the more that you have, that God has given you, that, that you've just inherited or come up with, God's going to expect that much more out of you. He's not going to give you more. He's going to expect more. So the Jews had a lot expected of them because they had the oracles of God committed unto them. And that's why they went up into captivity. And that's why God just, you know, the Babylonian army came in and just wiped them out then and, and took them captive. And, and they were um, held out of their land and, and everything else to try to humble them, bring them back. But um, anyhow, let's keep reading in Romans 11. Verse number 12, the Bible reads, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If I by any means, excuse me, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be graft in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. And here we're seeing the same rule being applied to all. So I started off showing how Moses was warning. Hey, don't think it's because of your righteousness that God is bringing you into this land and that you're receiving this inheritance and everything else. It's not because you're so great. The same warning now basically is coming upon those Gentiles who are grafted into this tree saying, don't get high-minded. You're just brought in because of faith. Don't start thinking you're so great and you're so special because it's not about you. It's about Jesus. You know, anyone that puts their faith in him can be part of that tree and part of that root of Jesus Christ. And you know what? God does use groups of people and nations to do his will and to do his work. And God removed Israel's place and gave it unto another that was bringing forth the fruits thereof. And, and hey, here's some workers. These workers were slack. These workers weren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And go back and read the Gospels and see Jesus' parables about the, the husbandmen and the, you know, the vine dressers and they're not doing the work that the Lord had sent for them and, and these servants that they had a job and they're simply not doing it. And what happens to them? God cuts them off. He gets rid of them and he hires new servants that are going to do the work for them and bring forth the fruits thereof because that's what he's looking for. People who are going to obey him, people who believe in him, first of all, and then they're going to obey him and do his work. And everyone is subject to to that. There is no special pass. It says, Be not high-minded, but fear. Verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness 
if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So you know what? If those, if those that were originally called the chosen people believe and they put their faith in Christ, guess what? They could come back and be part of that tree. It's that simple. And you, I mean, you're, you're in the tree, right? Now, it's, this isn't talking about, you know, losing your salvation. This is talking about who God's using as a people. Like, now he's using the Gentiles. He was using the Jews, now he's using the Gentiles. But hey, if the Jews start, start doing, you know, getting right with God and, get, you know, and, and turning to the Lord, great. They could be grafted in too. And they can do work for the Lord. Turning forward to Galatians chapter 3. It's the last place I'll have you turn, Galatians chapter 3. This is, kind of, this is a real big topic to try to, to try to take on in one sermon. We're almost done. I just, I just need you to see this one, this one last thing because we're talking about physical descendancy and everything else. And, you know, this concept of the election, you need to get it from the context is, is mainly what I want to just focus on and bring up. So that way, when you're looking at the various scriptures that use that term, you're being real careful with applying it. One of, the, one of the places where a lot of people get it wrong is in the prophecy scriptures like Matthew 24, where it's talking about God gathering together the elect, right? And that's one of the, re one of the reasons why we went into some of the detail here showing how, yes, sometimes it can be referring to physical descendants, but sometimes it's talking about people who are believers. Because when God comes to gather his elect, that's the rapture. And that's when believers are going to be gathered up. But see, people who have their, their timeline screwed up on end times events, they look at that and they say, well, that's just got to be Israel. So they think only physical descendants of Abraham are going to be gathered at that time. And again, that makes no sense. It really makes no sense, especially now. There's been so much intermingling and, and just corruption of, of you know, bloodlines anyways, which... I'm not saying God really cares about that. I'm just saying that, I mean, the Bible says avoid genealogies. And it's just a fact that it's happened. How, no one knows what tribe they're of anymore, of the, you know, from the children of Israel. They've been, they've been scattered abroad, and none of them have pure blood. And if you start, you know, you could look up, anyway, for all I know, I have Jewish blood. I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Because that's not who the Bible is referring to about his elect being gathered together. Someone, I mean, where are you going to draw a line? Well, if you have 5% blood, then you're considered you, or 20%, or 50%, or whatever, like, ridiculous. And anyways, the people who are going to be raptured, it's not based on their blood. It's based on Jesus' blood. Amen. This has nothing to do with your blood. Right. Your blood can't atone for your sins. Right. God's not going to gather you up because of how pure your blood is, because of who your father was. He's going to gather you up if, if he's your father and your, blood, your faith is in the blood of Jesus. Because that's the only blood that can atone. Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. And you know, all of Galatians 3, I recommend you go ahead and, and read all this later. Again, we're not going to go through this for sake of time. I'm almost done with the sermon. All of Galatians 3, it, you know, all of Galatians for that matter, but Galatians 3 especially, you know, you're going to see that, you know, the Bible talks about Agar and, and the, the, the um, allegory that God uses in teaching the, the son of the bondwoman versus the son of promise and that, that Isaac was a child of promise. He was, he was promised to, to Abraham that God promised him to have a seed, uh, you know, between him and Sarah, and that he was the righteous heir, and, and Ishmael was born of his, of his bondwoman, right? And that that was symbolic of the flesh and what he could do, and that um, 
the bond, the bond servant and the bondman is not inheriting because that's, that's, that's the best you can do of trying to make a progenitor just, you know, the best works of Abraham and his flesh was able to do, but that wasn't the child of promise. That's not who God promised unto him. God wasn't fulfilling his promise by giving Abraham a seed, by him getting another wife basically and, and having this son with, um, with, his bond, with his bond made. That wasn't the fulfillment of God's promise. He says, no, I promise you a son and you're gonna have that son. And it was a miraculous birth. And that was the child of promise. And if you jump down to verse number 26, we're gonna see, you know, th this whole chapter goes through that and, and helps explain that, that by being a believer, by having faith makes you a child of promise because God has promised eternal life unto all them that believe. Verse 26 says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Basically he's saying that promise that he made unto Abraham applies to you if you're Christ's. If your faith is in Christ, all those great promises and blessings that God made to Abraham applies to you. That great inheritance applies to you. Because even though there was a physical aspect of the descendants of Abraham receiving a promised land in Israel, it was all showing a much bigger spiritual picture, which is the one that really matters. There's a heavenly Jerusalem. There's a new Jerusalem that we're supposed to be looking towards. Not the physical Jerusalem that now is. We, we don't care about that. We are looking for the, the Jerusalem that comes from heaven. There's um, a spiritual nation. You know, we're supposed to be as pilgrims and sojourners in this world. You know, the world is not our home. We're not of the world. We're not looking to the world. We're not looking for the physical things of this world. We're looking for the heavenly things. And just as God promised Abraham because of his faith to inherit a great land, there's a promised land. It's not the physical promise land here. It's a promised land that God's going to give all of the believers uh, as an inheritance because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not by your own righteousness. And that's what we need to, that's what we're focused on. We don't give any special treatment or preferential treatment to anybody based on who, who they're descended from. We don't care about that. The Bible, especially the New Testament, clearly teaches, hey, there's neither Jew nor Greek. The Bible says avoid genealogies. We don't care about that. And we're definitely not going to support and bless people who hate the Lord Jesus Christ and reject him. It's not going to happen. The Bible doesn't command us ever to do that. And today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, guess what? You are elect. Amen. You're part of the elect. You're chosen. By virtue of being uh, born again, by being saved, by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter who your parents were, or their parents, or their parents, or their parents. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're elect, you're chosen, you're saved. Amen. So hopefully that helps you out. You know, keep, keep this sermon in mind when you read your Bible on your own and you, you come across the different passages. You know, don't just automatically assume that when the Bible says elect or election, that it's just talking about Jews. It may be, but keep in mind that it could mean other groups of people, it could mean believers and not the Jews, right? So just, just keep, bear that in mind as you're reading that you get the full context and apply the word appropriately. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for uh, the good doctrine that we could learn from your word. God, I pray that you please lead us and guide us and illuminate us in all truth and wisdom, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to do the work that you've set before us and that you'd help us to reach uh, as many people as we can. Lord, we want people to be saved. We want to spread the word of God. And I pray that you please help us to do so with, with good doctrines. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.